uh, it became viewed as the natural state of everything. It became part, it is really, really hard for many Arabs now to imagine their identity without hating the Jews, without hating Israel. It also became a cultural bonding mechanism. I was in London in June, and then, you know, there are a lot of Middle Easterners in London now. I went to a kebab shop to buy dinner, and the guy was Turkish. And I bought there, and he, I asked him where you're from, he said, Turkey, and he asked me where you're from, he said, Egypt. Hello, hello. The, the third sentence was about the Jews. <laughs> he was about, oh, did you see what, what the Jews are doing in Palestine? And I was like, man, just give me my kebabs. Like, really? I'm not here. But it became bonding. He's a Muslim from Turkey. That's, that's his mentality. I'm a Muslim from Turkey. I'm a Muslim from Egypt. And this is how we both bond, on hating the Jews. It's, it's absolutely sickening. And it operates independent of Jews. Even if there are no Jews, you find anti-Semitism, which is absolutely white. There are no Jews in Egypt. But it, the, the anti-Semitism became co-opted into the culture itself. During the Arab Spring, I saw how detrimental it is to any chance of progress. Both the government and the opposition will accuse each other of being agents for the Jews. So you would often have an Arabic t on Arab TV, there was a video actually that I had that, that's absolutely funny, with two people arguing two opposite directions. It was actually a common argument that happens in a lot of societies. It's, it's about population control. So you had an imam against population control, you know, be fruitful and multiply, like all the religious people thing. And he had like a sociologist talking about the dangers of over, overpopulation. And both of them are accu accusing the, the other idea that it's a Jewish conspiracy. So the imam is telling him, no, it's uh, population control, the Jews don't want us to multiply. And the sociologist is telling him, no, the Jews want us to overpopulate. And they are both accusing each other, how can you achieve any solution if everything is a Jewish conspiracy? Now, we have to understand something important about anti-Semitism in the Arab world. First of all, these are some statistics that are piled from the ADL and from the Pew Research Center. You'll see that 95% have unfavorable views in Egypt. 95% have anti-Semitic views, which is wild. Similar percentages are Jordan, Lebanon, the Palestinian territories, uh, Turkey is a little less. Iran, a country that threatens Israel with genocide, is actually the best. It's like uh, it's uh, 60 percent, only 60 percent anti-Semitic. So this is how prevalent the problem is. Now the question is, where did that anti-Semitism come from? Okay, what is the origin? It has, is it, does it have to do with Islam? Does it have to do with Arabism? Where it comes from? So, Islamic origin. So there is a unique kind of anti-Semitism that is Islam. Because Islam is a super, uh, superstitionist religion. That Islam came and abrogated both Christianity and Judaism, those two religions are invalid anymore. And the history of Prophet Muhammad has him having some quarrels and then later wars with different Jewish tribes. So that definitely went into the Islamic narrative, especially it is the founder of Islam. It is the Jesus of Islam. He had wars with the Jews. So that became a part of the profound story that everybody learns. Every Muslim learns the life of the prophet. So within that life, you'll hear about those treacherous Jews who tried to kill him. So that became a uniquely Muslim anti-Semitism. However, during Islamic history, it was basically that the Jews, the Jews were ridiculed, they were second-class citizens, they were unimportant. Because of history, the main Muslim conflicts were with Christian Europe, was against Christians. So a lot of hostility was, again, many times, against Christians more than Jews. That type of European anti-Semitism that we see was not truly there in the Middle East. There were pogroms from time to time. Actually, the Jewish Yellow Star originated in Muslim Baghdad. It was the first time that Jews were supposed to wear a patch that was in that honey mustard color. That was actually in, during the Abbasid dynasty in Baghdad. So there was an Islamic anti-Semitism, but if you're comparing it to inquisitions of the Holocaust, it was, it's not comparable. It was just, they lived humiliated, but there weren't mass scale annihilations. So where did that come from? How did the Muslim reach the idea of the eternal Jew that is always evil and that they could have to need to be completely annihilated. That was actually a European mutation. 
During colonialism, it was actually first Arab Christians who started translating the Protocols of Zion and translated books regarding the blood libel. And the first blood libel that was in the Arab world, it was actually in, uh, uh, in Damascus in 1840 when a Christian minister disappeared and the Christians accused the Jew that they kidnapped him to make a matzah with their blood. That was the first time that it was happened and it was brought in from Europeans. So yeah, there, was an, is, there is a uniquely Islamic anti-Semitism, but that conspiracy-based eternal Jew idea came from European colonialism. This is a list of pogroms that started happening in the Middle East that was were blood libels, as you can see, it was all around Aleppo, Damascus, Beirut, Yaffa, Jerusalem, three times Cairo, um, Sur Alexandria, four sites, and all over the Middle East that blood libel broke, whether it was under British or French rule. The Protocols of Zion was, uh, appeared the first time in 1900 in Arabic newspapers. Uh, then it was translated in full in 1927. It was translated again by an Arab Christian. And then 1951 uh, was actually the first known translation by a Muslim, by an Arab Muslim. So you can see how it seeped in and took time to be adopted by Muslims. Uh, Mein Kampf is the same way. So the Nazis are the first ones who actually tried actively to translate Mein Kampf. That process was problematic and took a while. And it requires Nazis to revise the book because there are actually parts of the book that are anti-Arab. So it took the Nazis a while to understand that and then go back and revise it and took out, take, take out parts that might offend the Arabs. And to revise also their thought in order to somehow include the Arabs in that racial purity claim, okay, the Arabs are not too bad, and then try to translate it. Because the first time that it was translated, actually the Arabs found it very offensive and it was after it got modified to be only against the Jews that the Arabs accepted. <laughs> And then it was, of course, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who went to Hitler and met him, and he's the one who started making pamphlets in Arabic, established a radio station, a Nazi radio station in Arabic, uh, in order to promote that Nazism. And then with time, that became part, that kind of morphed with classical Islamic anti-Semitism, hatred for the Jews, the treacherous, the ones that tried to kill the Prophet, it became the eternal Jew, uh, the eternal Jew that embodies all villainy and all evil in the world. Give this primordial archetypal understanding of good and evil and everything that is bad and about humanity. So post-colonialism later with the rise of pan-Arabism also adopted that. Jews are agents of, of Western evil and that created the, finally the sort of hybrid, hybrid anti-Semitism that you saw earlier in videos of both Islamic and Europeans and Jews, and this, as you can see, is a quote. This is from Al Azhar University, a major Sunni institution. Muslims must not reconcile with those Jews whom they occupy Palestine and sold its people and their property in any which will allow Jews to remain as a state on Muslim holy lands. Now, what is the solution? Is there a solution out of this? I just faced it with a very dark picture that you now might feel like, okay, this is not gonna be over. I believe that there is a solution, and that solution is education. The main problem of any kind of hatred is ignorance. And as I said, poor countries, broken states, broken education systems, high illiteracy rates. The only way to defeat bad ideas is to battle them with good ideas. And the only way to get the people, Europe was once, I mean, not just Europe, the entire Western world was once immersed in that same hateful ideology. And uh, things got much better. I mean, there are still problems and now we are worried about the right again. But things can get better. I'm an example of that. But the only way that things can get better is honesty, free speech, and education. The internet has broken a lot of the barriers that, used, that we used to have to talk to Muslim and Arab world. And I believe that if we put enough effort in order to promote dissident, courageous Arab Muslim voices, and they are there, uh, and we will have a result. People are not evil. People just believe in very bad ideas. My parents are not evil people. They just grew up in that environment. They grew up with these stories. Those 14-year-old Palestinian children, they thought they were saving the world. They were being quite altruistic. 
They were being selfless and sacrificing themselves to end evil. That's a bad idea. And the only way that we can change it is with, with education. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. It's going to be, as I said, painful. But it needs persistence, and it needs now. There's no wonder that the Palestinians are, 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 are engaged. A lot of them are, or many of them are engaged in the amount of terrorism that they are. If they go to a school named after a terrorist, listen to all of those stories in the morning, watch those cartoons on the TV, what do you expect? This is why we have to put global pressure, specifically on the Palestinians, who receive quite a bit of aid from Europe and the United States to revise their education and school system. And also to engage in an actual honest, honest dialogue with the Muslim and the Arab world regarding the nature of their beliefs and the nature of the education system that they spread. And there are brave and courageous voices. This is an example of some change that is happening. This is an Iraqi TV host TV show host that actually shocked and made quite an uproar with his introduction one day in his show. After 1400 years of cursing the Jews and the Christians in our prayers for calling upon Allah to disperse them, who have been praying for the destruction of their countries, but we are the ones who are left without country. He was basically shaming people that, that the destruction that we wish upon others inevitably only destroys us. This is a Saudi journalist who were talk, was talking about how the Palestinians are the ones who are responsible for the problems, they didn't want to accept peace, and they should accept Israelis and accept the Jews and just live with them and accept the peace. Uh, another Saudi intellectual resourcer, Twitter, and, and you can see how Twitter and social media did give a platform for these voices to arrive, and he's calling for making peace between Gulf states and Israel, enough for the hostility, enough for all of this, we have bigger problems, especially with the situation with Iran, uh, this is a Saudi uh, intellectual, Justin April, our greatest enemy is Iran, it's not Israel. We're obsessed with Israel, but Israel is not doing anything bad for us. This is another Saudi journalist who's talking about, actually for the first time, actually naming, a journalist is actually naming anti-Semitism. However, anti-Semitism in the Arab world is a product of loathsome racist education that is rooted in the Arab mentality that is used to labeling people according to tribal, family, and racial affiliations. Um, it is this education that promoted thousands uh, of Jews who were citizens of Arab countries to immigrate after the establishment of the state of Israel. Uh, they were expelled, but nevertheless, it's a good thing that a journalist is promoting this. As I said, there is hope, but we need to invest in education. Not just there, and this is the last part of my uh, presentation tonight. But also here, um, I was shocked. I thought I was moving to America, where like you know things are going to be better. I can talk about Israel. I can talk about Jews. I can talk about there's there's no that amount of anti-Semitism. But I was shocked to find, especially increasingly recently, that things are less secure than they seem to be. Um, I was working for the United States government for the past five years, teaching Hebrew at military school, and uh, I can. But then. Working with stand with us just on and off, just making a speech here and there. And I can sense, see the sense of urgency that the entire Jewish community in the, in, in the United States feels now. And that's what prompted them to ask me to come full time. <coughs> and that's what I did because increasingly in the United States and in Europe, anti Semitism has been growing substantially from very different directions. And we find ourselves now in a moment where we're talking about the Arab world, we're talking about all the ignorance, but we can't ignore the amount of ignorance and the potential risk from this country, even in the most educated circles, even on campuses, um, about the rise of, of new anti-Semitism, even old anti-Semitism. Now we have a challenge where a lot of different kinds of more anti-Semitism are morphing together to form a crucial and quite dangerous moment in the history of Jewish Jews of the diaspora. In Europe, we already see that people it's probably the end of European Jewry and the history, Jewish history in Europe and in the United States. We have three kinds of anti-Semitism that are rising. Far right anti-Semitism, far left anti-Semitism, and Islamic anti-Semitism that is making it to America. The easiest one to talk about and to call out is usually the far right anti-Semitism uh, because of all the political calculations and because of how old it is and also because it, it's usually uh, attached to different kinds of racism that society is very aware of. So you see that in the Nazis, we saw the Charleston March, Jews are not going to 
places change. And mainly right now you have this huge conspiracy theories of far-right activists, the great replacement theories, that Jews are plotting in order to replace the white race from their home countries, including America, uh, by importing large amount of immigrants from Muslim countries and from Latin America. And then you have names like George Soros are used in order to fuel all of that conspiracy theories. And there's a kernel, of course, uh, like every conspiracy theory is usually based on some sort of a partial fact, partial fact. And one of them is that Jews were always active in the civil rights movement. Jews are always at the forefront of promoting, you know, um, immigration laws and inclusiveness. And also like the entire legislation regarding refugee status or asylum status, which I personally benefited from, was specifically pushed by Jews after World War II and after what happened to them. Uh, and then you have the far left anti-Semitism, which is which is quite disturbing, and it's very different than, than in Europe. So in Europe, I was in Europe not too long ago. In Europe, the far left anti-Semitism is a classical European anti-Semitism, the idea of the gross child sitting on the piles of money, controlling the world. That is the Labour Party. That's Jeremy Corbyn. That's a lot of things that they say. That's actually different than the far left anti-Semitism here. The far left anti-Semitism here is. Quite ironic. So the far right anti-Semitism sees that Jews are not white enough. They are not white enough, but they can pass up as white, and that's the problem. That's why we need to get them out. Now the far left doesn't claim in the United States, doesn't just claim that the Jews are white, they are extra white. They are the most privileged people of white. So on the scale of intersectionality, Jews are the lo most losing of all the losers. Because it basically it's this pyramid where you're where the more victimized you are, the more rights you have, and the more privilege you are, the less you have. So Jews are the most privileged, you are whiter than white, so they don't deserve this. But it's not one reason, and nothing is only one reason. So we have also the rising hostility to the idea of nationalism in general, and nationalism is evil, and place to evil, and this rises idea of global, global citizenry, which leads automatically to animosity to Israel, because animosity is based on clear nationalist definitions of what a Jew is, and, and the, I mean, and the Jewish people, specifically, it's a Jewish state. So that automatically breeds hostility towards Israel, and then the rise of new, new anti-Zionism, which is just another form of anti-Semitism. And then you have classic Islamist anti-Semitism, we see it specifically <coughs> with activists such Linda Sarsour, Ilhan Omar, founders member of Ilhan Omar, and the things that you do, the things that CARE does, the student of justice in Palestine. And ironically, they go and they make this weird alliance with far left and they together have this push that's been going on in campuses for, for a few years, but we can see that it's not going away and it's promoting the ideas <coughs> and all of that. And this is why it's really important for all of us to be aware of anti-Semitism, be aware of the different forms that it, it morphs into, and to combat it in the United States and to educate people here in the United States. The education that I'm talking about is not only needed in the Arab world, it's obviously critically needed here, even amongst the most educated people, even amongst campuses, uh, on campuses and amongst students. Uh, we need to educate the public about the dangers of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism does not take foot in a healthy society. And it's also, always, always throughout history has been a sign of social and political and economic decay. And I, I escaped, I have no, I already escaped once, I have no other way to go. Uh, and they saw how anti-Semitism touched my life, even though that I'm not Jewish. And I want to make sure that what it, the decay that I saw happening in Egypt because of this neurotic, irrational thinking doesn't happen here in the United States as well. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'll be